Tarantula Girl coming to you from Lone Star Reptiles in Alvarado, Texas. I took the very long trek here on Labor Day weekend to spend time with a special friend and I was invited to an egg cutting of a really incredible clutch. Um, so wow, congratulations on that. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I don't know what's going to come out first, the interview or the egg cutting. So. Um, Let's just talk about the egg cutting. The egg cutting will come out first because I'll upload it later on tonight <laughs> okay. myself. Perfect. Uh, but uh, yeah, so we, we bought into that project when it first came about mm -hmm. and it's been a long road. Uh, my first year I had a lot of problems. We, we produced a lot of scaleless heads, mm -hmm. uh, but they were all males. <laughs> and so I had really bad luck with them. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, so we finally produced a few females the next year. I actually bought a female uh, that that first year and never could get her up to size to breed. Okay. And somebody wanted her, I sold her, you know, and she does well where she's at now, but Good. she just wouldn't eat for me. So this was the first season we had scaleless head, two scaleless head, mm -hmm. and we've got three clutches. And uh, so first clutch was a fire to a pastel mm -hmm. and I think we hit a firefly yes and beautiful. that thing was awesome uh, when y'all watch the video you'll see that I was very excited and I don't get excited very <laughs> often so that was probably one of the best videos as far as excitement goes but it is our first one and, and we're working real closely with Daniel Allison at Constriction Addiction uh, on this same project we bought in about the same time uh, I think about a week apart so I'll tell you, I've been in it from the from the start, and the two of us never gave up on the project. I mean, I've got several of them out there, scaleless heads, and and eventually we're gonna you know have several of the, the visuals. So it's super fun, and and I'm really excited to be working with it. So I know that a lot of people are very wary of the scaleless projects. Um, what do you have to say about that? You know, I mean. Daniel's had them for a couple of years in the mm -hmm. visuals, and the thing about it is, there's not a whole lot of extra care that, that's going to go into these animals. Uh, there is going to be some, but the cool part about it is, think about all the thousands of different combinations that have been made. Mm -hmm. Now we get to make them all over again, but in high definition. Right. It you is. You know, when you when you crazy. look at that animal, you you look at all these animals. They're they're kind of pixelated because of the scales. Right. So when you take the scales off, now they're what what I tell people is think about this. You got an analog TV versus a high def TV. <laughs> That's and, a good And that's exactly what we're doing. We're taking an analog animal and we're making a high def animal. Yes, because basically the pattern on a scaled reptile is appears pixelated. Exactly. To where once you remove the scales, wow. They're, they're just beautiful. And, and that's the first one I've hatched out. And just, I mean, you were there, you saw the looks of it. I mean, that's just an awesome animal. I can hardly wait till it comes out. Oh, I know. So we, it's still in the egg, obviously. We I'm, will keep them on paper. Okay. We won't put them on bedding. Uh, we are going to feed live. Mm -hmm. uh, not going to change any of the feeding habits. The only thing we're changing is the bedding. We're going to keep them on paper. Uh, they do need to be drier. We know okay. that for a fact. Uh, just like us, if if you know we're in, soaked in water all the time, we start to prune up. Well, these animals will do the same thing. Right. So. That's and the only difference that we're gonna we're gonna work on right now is just keeping them dry. What is your position on um, them potentially having problems shedding? I don't see any problems with it. I mean, Daniel is is I mean his are shedding just fine. Uh, we we do the reptile bomb on them, mm -hmm. you know, once a week uh, when they go into shed. Just like I tell people that are buying a snake for the first time. If you have a hide in your cage, which we don't have hides, but we do have, you know, rack systems that we can build the humidity up. Mm -hmm. Throw a couple wet paper towels in there, right before it sheds, it's going to come right out. Yeah. You know, I don't see any, any problems in it. Like I said, you know, me and Daniel talk on a weekly basis, I mean, sometimes daily on mm -hmm. this. And uh, this is the one project that we're keeping really close together. And right. we want to be totally transparent with this. I don't want to hide anything. 
I don't really want to sell any of these animals. I may, you know, just depends on what I make. Mm -hmm. uh, but the goal is to make everybody aware of what we're doing and, and, and show these awesome animals. I mean, they're beautiful, you know, oh. and, and to have something like that in your collection, I mean, it's just awesome. Speaking of which, I just got my very first scaleless head snakes today. And um, so I got um, a scaleless head fire male and female. So that's very, very exciting because I have the potential to, within the next year or two, make um, scaleless, fully scaleless super fires. So, wow, that's exciting. I just am totally blown away. I'm bringing some incredible animals home that were produced right here at Lone Star Reptiles. And um, you do have a website, and do you sell on Morph Market as well? No, not, I haven't in okay. a while. I, I had some issues with Morph Market, mm. and uh, it's not Morph Market itself, it's the people buying off of Morph oh, Market I that see. I had issues with. Okay. Uh, I sold on Morph Market for a couple of years, and I just didn't have the greatest luck. I do better with my website, okay. and I don't do reptile shows. I don't, you know, I advertise with the videos, uh, and then of course my website. Mm -hmm. uh, I do allow people to come to my facility where most people don't. Right. Uh, I think that's a key thing for us. Mm -hmm. The, the thing about it is I want people to see what they're buying. I handpicked every single animal I bought, mm -hmm. you know, getting started. And I want everybody else to have that same opportunity where they can walk in a facility, go in and pick out what they want, and that's what they get. Right. You know, buying something online, I mean, sometimes you have to. Mm -hmm. I was fortunate enough where we were able to travel anywhere and everywhere, and we handpicked everything. Yes. Uh, you know, and like these oxen sites and stuff I, I just you don't know what that animal is I mean people are putting pictures up that are not even that snake right you know sometimes not yeah. not all the time no but there is some scams out there and mm -hmm. I just I think it's so much better when you can go hand pick your animals and so we offer that here it works real well for us but yeah like I said we don't do shows the shows I go to every show, I make an appearance, I, I think they're awesome. Uh, the problem I have with the sh shows is the fact that you take animals out, you have to quarantine them coming back, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, because you don't know what's at the shows. Right. I mean, you know, these guys, there's some of these smaller breeders, and I mean, it happens, but you see mites at shows, you mm -hmm. see respiratory infections, now every animal in that building is subject to They're that. Exposed, yeah. And I just don't want to mess with it, so we don't do them. Tell me uh, maybe a couple of tips that you would have for maybe someone who's considering getting started or um, just getting started. Maybe your three most critical tips. One of the biggest things, I guess, is uh, be careful who you trust. Okay. Uh, there is people out there that will get to you, and that's the industry we're in. Mm -hmm. uh, it sucks, but it is the case. Right. And I don't think there's any of the bigger breeders can tell you that they've never got taken. Yeah. Because, I mean, we've all been there. Right. Uh, that's one of the biggest things. The second thing is don't go in buying all these multi-gene animals starting out. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm one of the few people that started with two snakes. I started with a Mojave to a normal. Mm -hmm. And, you know, every, well, I, the first year I ended up with, I don't know, 200 snakes. Uh, but I bought mostly single and double gene animals so I could see what I was making along the way. Right, and learn about, learn about their care, their temperament, and their husbandry as you were growing them up and keeping them. Well, that and the genetic side. I mean, mm -hmm. you want to know the genetics when, okay, so you take a five gene animal and you put it to five gene animal, you got potential to make a 10 gene animal. Mm -hmm. There's no way that you're gonna know what's in that snake. Yeah, well, and really even more because it could have, you know, some of those are gonna be recessive, some of them dominant. It the The combinations by the time you get five and five are, 
you know, I mean, you could have like 125 possibilities if you. Well, it's wild. I did a pro I did a project last year that was 256 to one odds. Wow. So that's 256 combos that you could have made with that one pairing. And exactly. That's ridiculous. And I think we've, in general, uh, some of us have carried this a little too far. Mm -hmm. uh, I did some animals last year that I was sketchy on. I always said that I would, I never wanted to be to that point where I said I think there's this and it might be that and mm -hmm. we're all there. Everybody that talks about it, we're there. It's and hard to know <laughs> for sure and you know even if you are super meticulous, super meticulous and you know and understand the genetics, the big breeders have genes within their animals that they're not identifying often when they sell to you because you had a clutch recently of <laughs> white snakes, which was a surprise. Yeah, it's another, so, it's another white snake. Tell and us about another that. White snake. Yeah. And another white snake. So that video was hilarious, yeah, by the way. Yeah, that's my new catchphrase. It's a white snake. <laughs> so what happened was, early on, I I had a lesser leopard that I was just trying to make some, some females mm -hmm. with. And so I put it to a, what we know now was a double head albino. Pied. What was it identified as? It was a, pie, a het pied okay. originally, and and I thought you know throwing it to a het pied. I mean I'm using her as a normal, mm -hmm. you know, and I mean she's a big girl. She lays big clutches, so I just used her as a head for pied. Mm -hmm. Well, we now know she was a double head, and so we were a good friend of mine, Daniel Allison. We were talking about some of my stuff and he said man I really think these are head pied he said you're throwing all these really you know cool striped animals mm -hmm. and, and I think they're heads and I was like nah you know but I, and I noticed you know I'm watching videos and I see people hatching these things and I'm thinking well why are they not hatching the striped ones like I am yeah and I'm real consistent with it and every once in a while I want to come out looking like theirs and so over time I'm proving these out to be head for pies mm. so I bred a inchy, uh, inchy leopard lesser to a pied to make heads, mm -hmm. and lo and behold, I made inchy lesser leopard pieds, and so he proved out to be head for pied. Mm -hmm. And the dad I just bred to, uh, the dad to that one I just bred to a uh, albino to make lesser leopard head albinos, and I just made lesser leopard albinos. <laughs> So surprise! It, yeah, I mean, it's just you know it's cool, uh, and a su surprise like that is really awesome. Right, of course. But you know, I, I did that video the other day. I'm expecting to cut heads. I cut the first one, and, and <laughs> if y'all could have seen my face, it was, it it, was we'll, priceless. We'll list that video in the description box. You you have to blink uh, to uh, watch that one. Yeah, that was funny. But there is also uh, genes that are fatal when you combine them. Yeah, and that's something you really got to watch for. I mean, uh, like the, the spider gene. I'm not doing a lot of spider stuff anymore. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty much selling off all my spider stuff. Uh, you know, I'm making really good deals on breeder females right now. But it's just one of them deals where I love the spider gene. I think it does some really cool combos. Uh, you just got one of my, you know, fire spiders last year, my mm -hmm. LSR fire spider. Beautiful. And they make beautiful combos they really do but you know due to all the controversy with the spider gene right. with all the head wobble stuff I don't have a problem with it mm -hmm. you know I a lot of times that quirkiness is kind of cool you know but and a lot of times they have no problem like that fire spider I have of yours well you know it's mine now but got from you yeah it's perfect a lot of fires have no problems. A lot of spiders, yeah. yeah. I've or, got yeah, several spiders I mean. out there that have no problems mm -hmm. at all. But you know, here's the thing: the general public says that they're they're defective. Defective. So you know what? Let's just get rid of them mm -hmm. and not even breed them. I've discussed this with several of the larger breeders, mm -hmm. and everybody's kind of in, in the same boat. Let's just get rid of them, and, and you know, just that it's not worth having to defend it all the time. I had, a, I had a customer come here about two months ago. Mm -hmm. She said, anything but spider. And I said, what do you have against spider? Well, this girl on YouTube, and I was like, okay. 
I said, well, let me show you a couple spiders just to show you that, you know, they're not all that way. Right. And they bought a spider. You know, they, they found a, a bumblebee that they really liked, and mm -hmm. that's what they bought. And the bumblebee is still, to this day, one of the most popular snakes available. I you love know, mine. The bumblebee is probably the next most popular right on, right behind a pipe. Yeah. You know, for a pet trade. Right. And, I mean, you can't produce enough of them. Mm -hmm. Well, this year, I don't think I've produced any of them. I've done everything I could to stay away from the spider stuff, and, and we're, you know, like I said, we're going to get rid of a lot of it. You're facing some it, of it Some of it I'm keeping because I just can't see myself getting rid of it. Mm -hmm. But like a spider pied, the drawback to a spider pied is not only there could be a defect along the way. I mean, it, it, in my experience, mm -hmm. say one out of 20 has a problem, I can live with that personally. but the public doesn't seem to be able to, be able to live with that. Mm -hmm. So we're going to phase it out. But a, a spider pied, you only have head pattern anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a hard snake to produce because if you put anything else with it, you really can't tell. Right. So, you know, I've got one spider pied and, and I think we're going to sell him this year. Just, you know, I can't have animals just sitting there that are, you know, not feeding and, and right. you know, they're not doing anything. So, uh, Going back to the things that, you know, the top three things uh, advice-wise, number two would be don't do this for the money. Okay. If you're getting into this for the money, you're getting in it for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. I've never been about the money. Y'all know me pretty well. I mean, we've been friends quite a while. I give away more animals than... I don't know anybody out there that gives away as many as I do. Not only do you give animals away, you give incredibly valuable animals away just when the mood strikes. I, um, I did a lot of giveaways for a long time. I quit doing the giveaways because, you know, we were trying to build our channel. And the thing with doing giveaways on animals is you get all these subscribers, and then as soon as, you know, the animal's given away, then all these subscribers drop off. And I started noticing that trend, and I get, I quit. I I feel like too, a giveaway can attract, um, not always the audience that you necessarily want as the okay. owner of your prized animal. Um, a lot of people that are going to flock to a freebie sometimes are not the patrons that have maybe invested the time or the energy to be mm -hmm. a quality owner. And I, I mean, I think giveaways are awesome. And I think there are a lot of amazing people that win them. Sometimes well, I worry about where those animals go. Well, yeah, and a lot of times you get these people, like I had one, oh, I don't know, three or four years ago, I did a giveaway and, and I got a comment, well, only the bigger breeders win. And, you know, I, the computer picks the names. I mm -hmm. don't do that, it, you know, but, it's always unfair because somebody else won and I didn't. Right. You know? And I, you know, we, we started doing contests. I mean, we still give animals away or t-shirts or whatever. But we started doing contests where you had to use your brain. And, you know, it's not just, I don't like the subscriber thing. I think that's, you know, ridiculous uh -huh. at times. So we started doing contests where you had to unscramble a word or, or we did my wife's name one time and mm -hmm. that was fun. I mean, we had... I don't know, it went on for 16, 18 hours mm -hmm. before somebody finally won it, and that was fun. And my friend Tun Jones, uh, we did his son, uh, who he was named after, uh, first name and middle name, and that was fun. Uh, but yeah, just doing for for subscribers, I'm out, I, mm -hmm. you know. So the third thing, my best advice is don't buy junk animals. Mm. Uh, you got to understand what we're trying to do is we want animals that when they hatch out, they're beautiful. Mm -hmm. In time, animals brown out. Right. And my goal is to produce animals that are three years, four years down the road, they still look as good as when they hatched out. Yeah, they're going to change a little bit, but they're not browning out. Right. They're holding that rich blacks and the rich yellows mm -hmm. and 
And nice contrast. I showed you you guys a few animals a little while ago. That, oh, yeah. that, you know, we're making that happen finally. And so the key is if you're out buying I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus, but if you're out buying all these auction animals, mm -hmm. you're buying what people can't sell. Yeah. They're throwing on, on these auctions, you know, you're buying, you know, let's say three three gene snakes for 50, 60 bucks. Uh, that's snakes that nobody wants. Mm -hmm. You know, they're throwing them out there because they can't get rid of them. And if you're going to breed junk animals, you're typically going to produce junk animals. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to be nice about that, but uh, it is what it is. I mean, you wouldn't take a, a a lame horse and put it to a thoroughbred, and and you expect to make good horses. Right. You know, genetics mean a lot, and when you're trying to produce good quality animals, you have to spend the money up front. So, so that actually brings up another interesting point. Um, I've kind of noticed recently, first of all, there are thousands of morphs now, some that are mind-blowingly amazing, and quite a few that either look kind of a lot like a normal, or maybe like a muddy version of a really beautiful morph. So do you have any thoughts on kind of a morph designer? versus someone who just randomly breeds morphs? Well, you know, there's several of us that are, I mean, we're line breeding, we're, we're... You have a vision. Well, and that's the deal. You have to, you have to envision what you're looking at. And I don't breed for right now. I breed for five years down the road. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to envision what you want to make five years from now. Uh, last year when we made the, the mahogany pastel clown, that's not what I was after. I'm after something further down the road. Mm -hmm. But I needed to get that mahogany in there and I was actually looking for just the mahogany clown when I hit the mahogany pastels. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I've got a vision where I want to be with that and, you know, we're working on a project that, you know, we're going to get there. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's going to take time. It's going to be five, six, seven years down the road before I get to where I'm after. Right. But, you know, you can't follow somebody else and ever make anything. Right. And I hear these people all the time, you know, well, Justin's making this and Justin's making that. Justin makes very beautiful animals. Justin didn't start making these last night. Right. Justin has been working on these for 10, 12 years mm -hmm. to get to where he's at. Justin Kobelka, if you didn't know. Yeah. So I hear this, well, I'm going to make this snake. Well, why are you chasing what Justin's doing? Right. Pick another gene or pick any gene mm -hmm. and follow that gene. Yeah. You know? I would say if you like really bright snakes, maybe choose two really amazing bright morphs and maybe, you know, plan to maybe put them together to see if you can come up with something brighter or if you like contrast, focus on that. Or if you're super into pides, focus on that. Or, I don't know, I mean, I feel like there is some value in, not, not that it matters to make a world's first, not like that's most important, or that you can't admire what someone else does, but I do think that there are a lot of people just chasing someone else's dream, when in the end, maybe it's more gratifying to do something, figure out what you personally like. Well, create your own dreams. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if you're in this for the right reasons, that's why you got into it, mm -hmm. is to produce really cool animals. And, you know, I mean, I'm not going to say the money doesn't matter because, I mean, face it, if we don't make money, we can't keep going. Well, uh, I mean, it costs me $1,000 exactly. a week in rats. Well, it's, you know, for people who think that snake breeders are you know, just greedy jerks for selling their animals, we most often are doing that so we can better care for our animals. <laughs> you know, when you're paying a thousand dollars a week for rats, I don't breed my own rats. I mean, and anybody that knows me knows that, but uh, I just don't like rats. So I there prefer we go. not to do it. Yeah, you're a busy man. Uh, yeah. They're nasty and, you know, <laughs> I mean, if I could feed them anything else, I would. But, <laughs> you know, I've seen the little sausage things and I don't see where that really works, but... <laughs> I thought about trying it, but those are pretty expensive too. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I don't like rats, so I, you know, I buy all my rats. 
And when you're spending that kind of money on rats, you got to sell animals to make that money. Right. And early on, it was a struggle. Uh, that would be another thing I'd talk about is, is you know, be careful and don't grow your collection too fast. Mm, I agree. I mean, you know, I hear, well, I've heard this term several times and I've discussed it with some of the bigger breeders and, well, there's no work in, in ball pythons. I don't know why you all say it's so much work. It's not a lot of work when you got 15, 20 snakes. Right. But when you got, you know, three to 500, you know, right now we're sitting at about 750 snakes with all the babies right now. And we still got two incubators plumb full. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a lot of work. You know, oh, yeah, I spend is. hours after hours out there and, and I do everything myself. Mm -hmm. I don't have employees. You know, it's all done by me. And I've tried employees and it just didn't work out. I'm too anal with what I do. I, and my wife says I'm way too anal. I can never have employees because they'll never do it my way. Mm -hmm. And it's true. I mean, I want my stuff clean. I mean, when y'all, y'all been here several times. You know, when you walk in the room, it's it's clean, it smells good. Oh, yeah. You know, and I'll tell you, I've been in rooms that ain't that good. Oof. You have the cleanest snake room that I've ever been in. Well, I appreciate that, but uh, it's not a lab, but it's, it's close. <laughs> it's pretty close. So, um, tell us um, a little bit about this guy and some of the things behind us. These are things that have never been shown on your channel before. No, I, I've never really shown that we do any kind of venomous stuff, but uh, down here in the bottom we've got a Gila monster. And then we've got the beaded lizard here. Uh, we've got a pair of banded rock rattlesnakes that are actually locked up right now. They're breeding. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. And then over here we've got a tiger rattlesnake. Uh, this is a, a western diamondback. It's a kind of a gold color. Uh, this one was actually born here at the house. Uh, and then over here we've got a copperhead. And I'm actually going to phase the copperheads out. We're going to stick with strictly, you know, the rattlesnakes. Uh, I've got a brand new rattlesnake going in this cage probably tomorrow. So, yeah, I don't talk about the, the venomous stuff a lot, uh, but it is something I, I do educational programs. Mm -hmm. And uh, we we train like the Parks and Wildlife here in Texas. Uh, I do a lot of their training as far as catch and release, uh, as well as animal controls and the police department. So uh, it's a lot of fun. And we've hooked up with Venom Life and a Sleepy Snake Bite Foundation. Mm -hmm. And if y'all don't know any, anything about that, please go check out a Sleepy Snake Bite Foundation. It's a non-for-profit. Uh, awesome program they're helping save lives all over the world mm -hmm. so it's it's a really cool foundation uh, and like Venom Life you know it's it's mainly Venom Life gear mm -hmm. you know but uh, they've also just bought out uh, Get Hooked okay. all their snake hooks and stuff uh, but Brent Schultz is a really awesome guy and uh, he sponsored me back in February and then we got teamed up with a Sleepy Snake Bite Foundation, and I've been doing a lot of uh, big group meetings and stuff on that, and it, it's it's an awesome program. So, and that stems from the venomous stuff. Uh, I don't do a lot with venomous. I mean, these are just basically pets, mm -hmm. and uh, like I said, we do take them out and do educational programs with them from time to time, but they're mainly pets. So, um, Gila's and Beaded's are the two unless they do discover the Komodo dragons are venomous. The only two venomous lizards in the world. How does it feel to be the owner of such incredible animals? It's awesome. And, I, and on the Komodo dragons, I think they did actually classify those as venomous. Did now, they? I think they, that's what I love you. Okay, so I'm very camera shy and... But you're so naturally photogenic. Yeah. Yeah, I'm naturally fat. I don't know about <laughs> photogenic. Uh, uh, but I'm a happy fat, so it really doesn't matter. Uh, so we started doing videos early on, and I think I think we did videos for about four, four and a half years, mm. and uh, never posted a single one. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, everybody knows I'm a redneck. You know, I'm a country bunking to the bone, but... When I heard my voice on the first video, I was like, oh, hell no. 
I am not putting that out there. And you know, I mean, in time, I got comfortable mm -hmm. in front of the camera, and uh, you know, I don't show emotions all that well. And I had a lot of people tell me, "Hey, you need to, you know, not be so serious." A good friend of mine, Brian Gundy, called me one time, and he goes, "Earl, he said you're way too serious. He said you got to lighten up." And I didn't really know. <laughs> My wife, she's making faces. If anybody watches my videos, they she know this. She does that every time. So, when she started doing that, it, it started becoming, you know, I have fun doing what I do, mm -hmm. but I'm a snake breeder. I'm not a video guy. So, it's gotten better over time. Uh, but we started the channel just to just to get information out there and mm -hmm. show what we're doing and, and have fun. Let other, other people see that we're having fun and maybe we can... You know introduce other people into this industry right you know i've got people call me all the time hey i just watched your video for the first time and, and it's really cool you know can we come out and look at animals come on you know the biggest thing for me was when we first got started we traveled all over the country mm -hmm. i didn't buy the first snake until i probably visited 15 18 facilities across the united states and I was told no a lot. Mm -hmm. To call, go and visit. Oh yeah. I'd call people up and I'd say, oh no, we, don't, we can't allow you in here. And Brian Gundy was one of the first people that let me in this facility. And, and it was just awesome to meet that man. I mean, mm -hmm. he's got a lot of knowledge. Oh yeah, definitely. And he's become a really good friend. And so uh, I vowed right then that no matter what, I would never breed snakes in my house mm -hmm. um, because I don't want people in my house. You know, that's yeah. This is our domain and mm -hmm. this is our private private place. But so we built facilities from from day one, and it was funny because I built my first snake building. It was only a twelve by twelve building. I had I don't know four snakes, and I thought it'll take forever to outgrow this. A year later, we were discussing building a bigger building wow. because. You know, it was just, it grew so fast. I went from having plywood racks to, you know, I told my wife there's no way I'd ever buy a Freedom Breeder rack. They're just ridiculous price. <laughs> you know, I, I couldn't understand how somebody could spend that kind of money. And three years later, I'm spending lots of money on Freedom Breeder racks. Lots of money. And the thing about it was, is once I saw how much cleaner I could keep my stuff mm -hmm. with with those type of rags. It's more efficient. Oh yes. You got the deli cup holders. I didn't have to wash bowls anymore. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, I'd have a 150 bowls stacked up in the living room. Been there. My wife would come home from work and go, why are these all over the counter? Well, I gotta wash them somewhere. I didn't have any counter space in the snake room, so yeah. I brought them in the house. And she was sure glad I got done, you know, quit doing that. But, and then, then I was so tight uh, my wife says I'm, I'm super tight with my money, and I am. Uh, I'll buy an animal, but I have to really think about it, and I have to really want that animal before I spend that money. Mm -hmm. And Which so, is wise. Yeah, but like supplies, I mean, I don't know if you can see these boxes beside me, but all my supplies are in here too. The deli cups, I was so tight that I would wash my deli cups. And she'd come home, and I'd have three or four hundred deli cups stacked up all oh around the counter. Oh my gosh. And she goes, are you serious? They're like four cents a piece. I said, it's money. You know, four cents a piece times 500. I mean, it adds yeah. up. Yeah. And now I've finally gotten to where I don't, I don't do that anymore. Uh, I'll rinse them out. You know, if they're if they're clean, I'll yeah. rinse them out. But if they're dirty, they're going to trash. Uh, but it was, it was really bad for a long time. But that, I was brought up, you know, we had money growing up. Yeah. Well, my dad had money growing up, and but he was very tight with his money. He still is to this day. I mean, you know, if I was to go ask for money, and you're going to have to have an itemized list of what you need it for, and you know, and then sign a contract, and you know, hey. it's it's pretty rough. It'd be easier to go to the bank. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm the same way. If somebody wants to borrow money from me, I don't yeah. know why. Right. You know, and, of course. And, you know, it's it's pretty bad, but. So, um, you've told me about, um, you know, the fact that you have to kind of be careful who you trust and that there are 
you know, not all the animals on the market are healthy or what they're represented to be. Who are your mentors? Who do you really admire in the hobby? Well, you know, Brian Gundy's probably one of my biggest people. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, Greg Graziani, we're pretty good friends. You He's know. awesome. Uh, yeah, I've done some alligator stuff with him, and uh, Greg's an awesome guy. Uh, Michael Cole, I mean, mm -hmm. I can't say enough about him. Uh, the venomous side, you know, I, I've dealt with Tom Crutchfield, you know, for years, mm -hmm. and we we went to his place a couple times a year. Uh, you know, Garrett Demeyer, I mean, he's a, a really nice guy. Yeah, and it's and it's kind of cool when you when you're going around to all these different places. Like South Florida, everybody knows everything can live. Right. And but you go to Garrett Demeyer's place, and we went there in April. He was like oh, April fifteenth, yeah. and it's. Arctic. And, well, no, he, you know, he, I, t I called him and I said, hey, we're going to be up there. Mm -hmm. It's going to be around April 15th. I mean, what's the temperatures like? It's all the earliest, usually in the 80s. And I packed, you know, of course, I wear shorts year round, but I packed my shorts and nobody took jackets. And we get off the plane and it's, I don't know, I think it was 14 degrees. There's snow on the ground. I mean, they had a freak storm rolled in. Torture. So we head straight to Walmart, get everybody jackets. So, you know, of course, I didn't want one. Uh, then the rental car was ridiculous. It was a Chevy Sonic, and the heater worked from the dash to about here. It didn't, <laughs> didn't actually get to you. So, and my mother was with us on that trip. Good First thing you didn't have a coat on. Oh man! Well, you know I got a fur coat anyway. But. <laughs> so my mother's in the back seat with us, and she wanted to go on this trip, you know, because we were doing other things. But so we drive up to Garrick's place, and it's about a. I don't know, three or four hour drive from from Milwaukee to, to Wausau. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't sure, I never knew that had mountains there. Mm -hmm. And Garrick actually lives on a mountain. And uh, we get up there and I was planning on spending five, six hours. You know, he's got a big collection, right? And so his one of his helpers, workers, whatever you want to call him, he comes in there and goes, are y'all staying in Milwaukee tonight? And I said, yeah. He said, you might want to get off the mountain now while you can. And so we walk outside and the car's gone. I'm just covered in snow. <laughs> and I was like, well, I guess we need to get going. So we, we got to spend about an hour and a half with him. But he's an awesome guy. And looking forward to, to you know, talking to him in October. We're mm -hmm. all going to Tenley. So this will be my first trip to Tenley. I've oh, been to shows man. all over the place, but I've never been to Tenley. Cool. So it's going to be an awesome show. Uh, but yeah. The be here, be careful who you trust thing. I, I'm gonna tell you a story that happened to me early on, and this was just you're wanting something so bad, and the deal was so good, you should have known better. Mm -hmm. And they got me, and my wife laughs to this day. I, matter of fact, I still have two tubs as a joke uh, that stay empty in, in a rack. And those are what we call my ghost snakes. Mm -hmm. uh, early on, it was uh, what was that? Uh, was it? I believe it was killer bees. Mm -hmm. So just a super pastel spider is nothing. But at that time, I mean, they were I don't know, two thousand dollars a piece, something mm -hmm. like that. And so I had this lady that had advertised some. And I, would, I could get them for like 500 a piece, right? So I was going to buy one, and, and my wife says, at that price, buy them both. So I did. And uh, never money gram money to somebody for snakes, ever. Ooh. So I sent the money gram out, and as soon as I walked out of the Walmart from sending the money gram, I just got this real bad feeling in my gut. And I couldn't sleep that night. And the next morning, I mean, naturally it was a scam. And the lady calls me, and you know, I'm buying babies. And uh, and I've heard this happen to a lot of people over the years. So I'm buying babies, and and the next morning I get a message from her that they can't get them on the plane because one of them's pregnant, and I have to ship them a different way, and they need more money for shipping, and and that's what I knew, for sure. And I called her. The local police department they got with the police department where the money was sent and you know i mean it's they're gone mm -hmm. you know they're probably not even in the u.s to start with 
you know, it happens with dogs a lot. I, yes. You know, uh, there's a lot of scams out there, and, mm -hmm. and and that's a lot of what I mean by be careful who you trust. But there is people in the industry that you know. I mean, I've had it happen to me. I've seen Justin Cabelka snakes on somebody else's website mm -hmm. for sale. When you know, right? If you know the animals, I mean, think about it. When you got an animal, there there's only one of them. You know, yeah. in the world, it's the world's first, and you find it on somebody else's website for sale. You know, come on, guys. Yes that's it's true i mean yeah educate yourself on what's out there what a fair price is if you see something interesting don't just jump do some research um if it's on a forum or something like that and it's not a name that you know um you can ask the person for references research them um Absolutely. A, a lot of us have youtube channels these days so i feel like that really kind of helps people get to know I mean, they kind of get to see where you work, what you're working with. Um, a lot of times, you know, people can tell by the comment feed. Um, a lot of times people leave good or bad reviews from a, from a business. Just type in their name. Um, and sometimes you type in their name and you see five complaints right. that this person sold me a snake and then you know, wouldn't wouldn't return my emails once I PayPal'd them, and you know, or or whatever. And so, yeah, I would say, do your research, and you know, you want to make sure that that's a reputable breeder. It's going to be a healthy animal. Well, and another thing is, you know, you got a lot of flippers. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by flipper is, you got somebody that'll buy everybody else's animals, you know, wholesale, and they turn around and flip them themselves. Well, the drawback to that is, is, you know, he may buy animals from a couple very reputable breeders and then he gets animals from somebody that's not reputable and, and then may have a respiratory infection or, mm -hmm. or mites come in and all those animals get mixed up together. Right. And so you're not knowing where these animals come from and, you know, you buy something that gets shipped out to you and the next thing you know, you just brought in mites. You brought in a respiratory infection, you know, I deal with things a little differently like that, but if I bring an animal in, it gets quarantined for, for 90 days. That is very excessive. I get that. But at the same th same fact, I don't have to worry about any of my animals getting sick. Right. I have a, a quarantine room where, you know, right now it's empty. I haven't brought anything in a while. I brought some retics and berms in lately. Uh, but they actually were in quarantine for longer than that. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a reason for that. I mean, you know, I just, I don't want to take any chances. You know, when you have four or five animals and lose everything, it still hurts. But when you have four or five hundred animals mm -hmm. and lose everything, you're, you're done. Right. You know, I mean, we've built this up, you know, from two animals to what we have now. And the one thing I will say is, when you start breeding, don't go out just blowing money. Research what you want to do and buy the animals it takes to do that one project. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, go on to another project from there. But if you're just starting, like if, if I was giving you advice today that you're just starting today, I would tell you to buy nothing but females. Mm -hmm. Because females are going to take you you know, two months to, I mean, two years to two and a half years to get up to size. Right, two to typically. three breeding seasons. Yeah, typically. So you don't need males. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you think about this, you got, you buy a male now with a female and you're feeding that male for two years for nothing. Huh. You know, where you could have spent that money on another female and had two females and by the time you're ready for that male, then that same male may be half the price that's true you know because I mean yeah because morphs typically lose their value well, you, you know dominant or co-dominant is going to lose value quicker than, mm -hmm. a, than a recessive Recessive. of course but so like when I first got into this you know a pied was I don't know six seven thousand dollars so I bought heads mm -hmm. I, did, I didn't even buy visuals I, I did head clowns you know 
I was telling y'all earlier, I, I produced my very first clown, it was a pastel clown, from a super pastel head clown to a posh head clown. <laughs> and I was so mad at my wife, uh, she bought two posh head clowns for $125. And I said, why would you do that? You know, they're posh heads. And she goes, well, you just never know. Well, one died on me at about a year old, and the other one I bred that you know, super pastel head clown too. And the very first day I cut was a pastel clown. And she looks at me and she goes, <laughs> now what? And I still have that head clown to this day, you know. Uh, I don't just sell off all the heads. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you've got, I mean, I've got that particular girl's about 4,500 grams. Right. She lays big clutches, so, you know, I can put some really nice clown stuff to her and, and keep producing. But... You know, I, the pies were the same way. I, I produced my very first pies from a head to head pairing. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, we have 25 females out there that we breed every season now. Uh, but it's taken years to get to that point. You know, we've been doing this since our 13th year. And I didn't go out buying all these high end animals. I, I produced everything along the way. And I'm probably a little behind a lot of people, you know, that's been in it this length of time. Uh, but it's so much easier for us to see what we're making because right. we produced it all the way. And that's one of the biggest things when, you know, like I said, buy females first, mm -hmm. uh, you know, however many you can afford. And, and I say that not just because you can afford the snakes, but know that you're going to have to, you know, keep up with them right, and, and right. take care of them for two years. So buy what you can afford and then. A, a year, 18 months later, then look at buying a male or a couple males to put to them females. And by then, those males are going to be cheaper. So, you know, say like right now, if, you know, I don't know, let's say a banana clown, I think they're about a thousand mm dollars, -hmm. maybe, I don't know. Uh, next year, they may be five hundred dollars. Right. They may be six hundred dollars. I don't know what they're going to go for, but, mm -hmm. you know. Probably less than they do this year. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, if you got a couple of head clowns this year and you, and okay, so a banana clown this year is 1200 bucks. I don't know what they are. Mm -hmm. uh, because I'm not selling any. I'm keeping mine. Uh, but next year you might buy, be able to buy a three gene banana clown for right. the same price. Yeah, that's true. You know, so, and now you're going to get a, a lot more bang for your buck, you know, down the road. Well, um, I heard a funny story from, um, Chris um, Eaton from um, Eyeball Pythons, I think, and um, he was saying when he and his partner got started, they were so excited, they went crazy, they bought, you know, every ball python they could get their hands on, and they were just like, oh, they got all these cool morphs, and they were so psyched, and, you know, they had, they got racks, and so a short time later, they were very dismayed when they realized they had like eight males to every single female and they were like oh, what did we just do because the males were available they were finding deals and so they were like yeah we're gonna rule the world <laughs> and they yeah. were like okay unless these guys can you know do something on their own we're we need to we're kind of turned upside down right now and see and i never went after the deals that was my thing i mean you know, Brian Gundy kind of mentored me mm -hmm. early on, and he told me, sir, he said, buy the best example of what you're looking for, mm -hmm. always. And so let's go with the Orange Dream. Uh -huh. So when I first got into the Orange Dream, started looking at it, I was offered some stuff. Uh, I'm not going to mention where I was, but I thought it was ugly. Mm -hmm. I seen it, and it was just a a better looking normal is what I saw. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I don't know, I think they're about 4,500 bucks a piece. And I was like, no, I'm out, you know? So then a couple of years later, Brian Gundy says, what do you think about Orange Dream? And I said, I, I'm not interested. And he goes, are you sure? And he said, have you seen what Ozzy's doing? Mm -hmm. And so while I'm talking to him, I'm on my phone, I'm looking up Ozzy and, and I see what Ozzy's doing. I was like, man, that's nice. And I said, but that's not what I saw. Mm -hmm. when I found them. Right. And so I bought one of Aussies and, and now I'm making some really wild orange dream stuff. 
but the simple fact is don't just jump on the first one you see right you know unless or the cheapest one yeah, necessarily i mean i've i've paid hundreds of dollars more for something because i you know i, I tell you a story this has been years ago when a bananas first you know when i could afford them mm -hmm. uh, they were like 10 grand when i got into them and uh, I actually went to the bank and took out a loan for ten thousand dollars on a snake. Now that's not something that you know the bank really wants to do, <laughs> and you can't tell them it's for a snake. <laughs> uh, I tried that the first time, and he said no. So I spent ten grand on a snake, and uh, so I produced my very first bananas, and it, it was nothing more than a banana pastel. And at that time, they were pretty spendy, and. Uh, I had sent one to Brian Gundy, you know, mm -hmm. Brian got one from me, and, and so a guy was watching his unboxing video, and he calls me and goes, hey, do you have any more than banana pastels? And my first instinct was no, because I produced three, and one was not as pretty as the other two. And so my first instinct was no, and I said, yeah, I do. And he goes, well, how much is it? And I, I put a ridiculous price on it. You know, I mean, it was way over what they were going for, but I, I didn't want to sell it. Mm -hmm. And the guy said, well, I can get it for half of that out here. And I told him, I said, well, then buy it out there, dude. I mean, I'm not stopping you. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the conversation ended, and, you know, I went on about my day. About two weeks went by, and that guy calls me back. He said, do you still have that banana pastel for sale? And I said, yeah. And he was it's still the same price. And I said, yeah. He goes, well, I'll take it. I said, nah, hold on, man. I said, why didn't you buy that one that was half the price? He said, well, because it ain't near as pretty as that one. That's what I'm getting at. I mean, mm -hmm. sometimes, I mean, you know, I know Brian's done it. I've done it. I mean, everybody I know has done it. We overpay for something because it's that nice. Yeah. But when you're putting in the best quality animals, you're going to make the best quality animals. Right. So I want to point out that um, we're not saying that... You should never buy from someone who's not a famous breeder, but just if you're unfamiliar with them, just check them out. Well, and absolutely, I've seen some of these guys that are, you know, got two or three snakes producing some really nice stuff. Yeah, they're really focused you know, on but, maybe one Yeah, they, they went out and bought the best quality animals they could find, and, you know, they, they have three or four or five. I've got one guy that I know, he's got eight snakes. Mm -hmm. That's it. And, of course, every one of those eight snakes are double heads triple heads but they're right. like visual clowns well and there are a couple well there are lots of small hobby breeders that just really do it for fun that are creating some really incredibly beautiful animals absolutely absolutely so just because somebody's small scale doesn't mean you shouldn't buy from them but like we said if if they're not someone who's well known and has a positive reputation check them out yeah check them out for sure so I know you've been working with Venomous for a long time, but since you have recently expanded your Venomous collection, I did bring you a small gift. Gotcha. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, sorry you got a little beat up on our travels. <laughs> the box did, the product is good. But I wanted to gift you with a Venom lock. Okay. Because as you know, we had a, an, a little incident last year and this Venom locks, I believe, may have saved my producer's life. So make sure and keep this with you. Awesome. And um, I know that you go out and do a lot of uh, snake removal and things like that. So it's just something small and easy that you can keep right. in your pack. And um, I know there's been a little bit of pushback about um, venom extractors not working. And this is not, this does not claim to be a venom extractor. Right. It's a circumferential compression device to um, simply loculate the venom in the area of the bite, of course, until you can get to medical treatment. Right. And in the one human trial, which was in my experience, it was very, very effective. And so, yeah. Yeah, I know we discussed this uh, last year mm -hmm. uh, when he actually, and, and that was crazy because y'all are in there <laughs> cleaning venomous clay cages right and he walks outside and moves a, a stick in the yard and gets bit well you know the <laughs> thing is when you're working with venomous snakes you know where they are right and it was just wild that it was uh 
kind of an unseasonably, unseasonably warm winter day. And that's not really when you expect, I mean, it snows where we live. Right. So we, we weren't, in the summertime, we're very vigilant when you reach into a wood pile. But, you know, in the middle of winter, you, it should be on our minds, but it wasn't. I caught these, there, there was several of them I brought home, I don't know, I think there were nine uh -huh. all together. Uh, it was in the middle of the winter. Uh, it was 36 degrees outside. Wow. I got a phone call from Texas Parks and Wildlife asking me if I would go check out a snake call. And I was like, it's 36 degrees outside, dude. Mm -hmm. He was, they're calling me saying they've got all these snakes. And so I looked at my wife, I grabbed all my gear. I saw we back in a couple minutes. So I said, there ain't gonna be no snakes. And I was gone about 30 minutes and come home with, with nine snakes. And they were, they're lucky they survived. I actually brought them in the house and, and warmed them up slowly. Mm -hmm. um, Cause they were almost popsicles. Wow. And, uh, so it is. It does happen. Uh, they were actually moving a wood pile when when mm. all these snakes come out. So they were dinned up, you know, not right. so comfortable until somebody <laughs> disturbed them. So yeah, we we've caught them in the middle of winter too. Well, when you go on those calls, you'll have to take the venom lock from now on. We have we have a lot of safety features. I mean, that that particular day, I think you could have reached down and picked them up when that yeah. issue. I mean, they weren't moving. We're not recommending that, by <laughs> no. the way. Uh, that it was crazy. I, there was a rat snake. He tried to bite me so bad. <laughs> he was just his mouth was like this. It was in slow mo. Oh, it was crazy. And the wow. guy said, "What are you gonna do with it?" And I said, "Well, we're gonna try to warm it up and release it. Mm -hmm. You know, when it warms up." But you know, because I don't want to see him die. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it was it was pretty crazy. Wow. And the lady was frantic when I got there. There's all these snakes, and there was little baby copperheads. They'd probably run over five oh, or six wow. of them already. And that kind of sucked, but we rehomed all the babies, and, and uh, uh, we rehomed everyone but this one, and uh, it's it's leaving tomorrow. So awesome! Well, the service and the work that you do is very important. Congratulations on all your success with your business. You and your wife are just, you know, we really admire you guys, and you're incredible, and what you're doing is just fantastic, and I love that you kind of follow your own path and that you have built yourself from the ground up more than once actually. Yeah. And um, you guys have faced tragedy and you know, you've been victorious since then. So, I mean, you've helped me out. We had our big incubator crisis earlier this year and I think we were on the phone every day with you you know, walking me through um, installing computer fans and the incubators that I was building, which was awesome. So that was such a good idea because they're manufactured to um, work without with producing very little heat. So you know that was that was something I hadn't thought of, and you guys are just awesome. Well, yeah, and that's another thing. You know, with the incubators, uh, we discussed this, you know, in depth back then. But <laughs> the incubators. They're a pretty simple piece of equipment. Mm -hmm. And where we fail, or where the incubators fail, is from our failures. Mm -hmm. Again, spend the money on the proper equipment. You yes. can use a styrofoam box. I mm -hmm. don't care what kind of equipment you're using for the incubator. The thermostat is the most important thing. Right. And, you know, I'm not saying anything towards y'all or towards anybody that's right. done this, but when you buy a cheap thermostat, you get what you pay for. Mm -hmm. And y'all paid a very big price. Exactly, I experienced that firsthand. Y'all so. lost a lot of eggs and, and that, that's just, it's horrible. Uh, and y'all lost some big clutches of retakes and you know, yeah. and it, it is, it's horrible. It was a shame. And you know, I, I incubated some stuff in a, in a styrofoam shipping box this year. Wow. And so that was the uh, Panda Pie project, mm -hmm. and we've got another clutch in the incubator now. Awesome! When is uh, that one due? Yeah, I couldn't tell you. I'd have to look. I, you know, last year I was real good about having all that stuff on my phone, and, yeah. and I could keep it in my head. And, you know, we're on clutch sixty-eight right now. Uh, wow! And that's this is our best year. Uh, we could have bred about a hundred and eighty females this year. I only bred ninety-three. And I think we're going to top out at about 72 clutches, which is enough. 
Uh, oh yeah. You know, you you, you also got to understand when you're hatching out that many babies, you got to have a place to put them all. Oh yeah. And, and so, you've got to find the time and the energy to take care of every single little neonate and check on them. And well, I'm gonna tell you a little funny story about <laughs> six, seven years ago. Uh, I just met Chris uh, with Sea Serpent, mm -hmm. and love that guy to death. Mm -hmm. I, anybody who's seen our room, we, we do all Sea Serpent racks for our babies. Uh, they're very nice racks. Well, I had ordered enough racks to cover what I was going to produce that season. Mm -hmm. But we had a really weird season. We had very large clutches. Mm -hmm. Our uh, average that year was 9.7. Wow. We only had, I think it was 38 clutches that year, but about 30 of them had, were laid within a seven day period. So, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, which means they all were hatching out yeah. within a seven day period. And we didn't have the racks yet. Oh I had, my god! I had two hatching racks that hold 42 snakes apiece, and we literally had 10 snakes per tub. And I was not working at the time. I had retired from from the oil field, and so I was home every day. And I'm telling you, all day, every day, I was cleaning those racks. With 10 babies per tub, they're never clean, and it was horrible. And when those racks came in, I was never so happy to get racks set up. <laughs> you know, the hardest part is getting all these racks, you know, set up for that first time. And we had clutch after clutch we were having to do all at one time. And, oh, it was terrible. Feeding day sucked. <laughs> you know, you, you take, you know, one tub out and would stack up ten tubs on the floor. And I'd put individual snakes in them, feed them all, then put them back in the same tub. And, wow. oh, it was crazy. By the way, Chris, I've emailed you. I can't wait to hear back from you. <laughs> <laughs> you have to call him. I will. Yeah, I don't ever email him anymore. I just call him. All right. Chris Good is time. actually, we're in the process of designing a brand new rack for me right now. Uh, we're going to use the Freedom Breeder, the new Freedom Breeder F, uh, FB5 tubs. Mm -hmm. And we're doing racks that hold 120 tubs a piece. Wow. So I'm looking forward to getting that going. Uh, I can put 105 babies in, in a little bit bigger space than what I've got, what is it, 84 in now. Hmm. So that I'm looking forward to that. Which for little ones is plenty of space. They Absolutely. won't be able to live in there quite so long. No. But since you sell most of your offspring, there's no need for larger housing for well, hatchlings. These, these tubs are 5 inches wide, they're 18 and a half inches deep, 3 and a half inches tall. So when you figure you know, 400 grams, mm -hmm. you know, and then they have to be moved out. And those would be for all the stuff we're selling. Right. So it'd be great for that. Uh, and they have the deli cup holders. That's the best part. Oh. They're built in. I, I use yeah. three inch PVC pipe in all my tubs now. And then I use the four ounce deli cups. So these have the cup holders for the four ounce deli cups. So it, it, it works great for us. And it's going to be that much easier to clean. And, that, you know, I was telling you earlier about the racks. I said I'd never buy them Freedom Rear racks. Well, I seen the rack in person the first time, and at that time, uh, Jesse wasn't, you know, working the way mm -hmm. he was working there, but he wasn't running the place. Uh -huh. His brother Jeff was. And Jeff come to me and told me, he said, Earl, he said, I want you to look at these racks. You know, we'd been talking some, and I just, I was blowing him off because I wasn't spending that much money on racks. Mm -hmm. He pulled that tub out the first time, and back then you got to understand I built all my racks out of plywood. I'm never going to tell you the plywood racks are bad because I, man, I used them for years and, and I bred a lot of animals in mm -hmm. them and they did really good. Uh, you know, one rack maybe a hundred bucks tied up in it. Yeah. And so he pro and, and I used a squeegee with a three foot stick on it to squeegee out the tops and all that. And so he pulls these, these tubs out the first time and he pops it front off and pulls it top out. Oh, yeah. And I was like, are you kidding me? Dude, that just made my life easier. And I whipped out the credit card and I bought two of them right then. Wow. And then I think it was two weeks later I bought the third one and now I got a room yep, full of them. Yeah, a whole, yeah. And 
pretty wild. I mean, I went in debt within racks, but it was so worth it. Well, you know, you have to think about the price that you're paying in labor and frustration, especially when it's just you. And then ultimately you did end up going back to work. And so your time is limited, it's precious, you've got to sleep at some point. And there comes a time when you're just like a zombie out there <laughs> and you just, you know, you just don't have anything left in you. And so if there's a way to simplify, simplify the task so that your animals are getting quick, efficient care, sometimes it's worth the money. Well, you know, back then, you know, of course I didn't have as many animals either, mm -hmm. but uh, the wooden racks took a lot of time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because I mean, I would have to, once a year, I'd have to sand them down, repaint them with mold proof paint. Which, by the way, there's no such thing as mold proof paint because it all molds. <laughs> yeah, and wood uh, expands oh, and man, contracts a lot, and then your um, trays don't slide oh, in. Oh man, yeah, you're yanking on them, and the water's flying everywhere, making yep. it even worse. And yeah, it was terrible. Uh, but you know, for somebody first starting out, there, there's a lot of affordable racks out there today, mm -hmm. like Sea Serpent, for instance. You can buy some really like the hashing racks. They're like 220 bucks or something for, right. for 18 tubs. Come mm -hmm. on. I couldn't build them for that back then. Right. You know, uh, but they weren't available back then. Mm -hmm. uh, matter of fact, my very first racks I actually bought were still wood. Yeah. And when I got them in, you know, they're wood. You had to paint them. You know, I, I did a, I don't know, a lacquer finish on them. I ended up having to sand all that off because mm -hmm. it was very toxic and it, right. the smell never would go away. So yeah, even early on it was wood racks and and that's what I could afford starting out. And you know, over time, you know, the biggest thing is don't overspend getting into it. Yeah. You know, Build yourself build, up. Yeah. Let your animals pay for themselves as you, you know, have your first breeding season, mm -hmm. maybe put a little bit of that back, reinvest it into your collection. You know, my very first season I bred a Mojave to a normal. I had eight eggs. I had that same incubator I'm using today, had one clutch in it that first year. <laughs> uh, and I've never changed that incubator from the day I, I, I went and bought a cooler, it was working. Uh, that incubator still has the condenser and stuff in it. Hmm. Uh, it's never been taken apart. All the rest of them I've ever built, I gut them. But that one, they, they just put a brand new compre compressor in it, and I didn't want to tear it apart, so it's super heavy. But I've never changed it from day one, and it hatches everything every year. Uh, but it had one clutch that first year. That's and that's a really cool origin story. You started with two snakes. Your first breeding season, you had one clutch. My very now. first Mojave was like 750 bucks. Oof. You know, we had a normal that, that was given to us. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing, I, I worked with venomous and I loved venomous snakes. I started with rattlesnakes early on. I don't know, I was probably 12 years old. And uh, I just played with them all the time and I loved them. Mm -hmm. And, but it wasn't till I saw a pied. Oh yeah. I saw my very first pied and I told my wife, I said, I want one of them. And so we hunted for them and they were high. Oh yeah. And so we went to a reptile show and, and they had a Mojave. And like I said, it was about 750 bucks. And it was a little tight spending that kind of money at that time. And, but we bought it and grew him up and, and he had an L on his back. We called him Lucifer. Because <laughs> uh, he bit me every time I touched him. And so we called him Lucifer. And uh, so we bred them, and that was the only snakes we had. And we, like I said, we produced eight babies, four Mojaves and four Normals. I'll <laughs> never forget that first clutch. And uh, it was awesome. When, you know, we sold a couple of the Mojaves, we kept the females, and we sold all the Normals off. And what I, what I sold, I went out and I bought a couple more females. Mm -hmm. And we didn't really buy, you know, of course, the next year I met Mike Wilbanks. Mm -hmm. And... You know, I was making a lot more money at work by then. Yeah. And uh, so I started spending a lot of money. And we'd buy, you know, 10, 15 animals at a time, and then we'd drive up to Oklahoma City and pick them up. And, you know, we but we were buying nothing but females. And I just think that that's the best way to do it. Yeah, that's definitely, definitely the smart way to go. I even still kind of, 
when we take inventory, I'm like, man, we're, we're male heavy again. Not that we have more males than females, but more than we need. It's because something will catch my eye and sometimes I buy it or I don't know, we get, you know, a group of animals or something and I think to myself, oh, we need to unload some males again because it just happens. Well, you know, when I bought into the scaleless project, I'm not going to say I made a mistake, but and I probably wouldn't do it any different today. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it was a really high end project. And I mean, at that time they were just extremely expensive, but I bought two males. And I did that because I've had it to where a male won't breed. Yes. And so I thought, okay, I'll get a backup male. That way at least I know one's gonna breed. And I think we produced, I don't know, 12 or 14 scaleless heads the first year. Every one of them were males. Mm -hmm. and. I kept thinking, had I bought a male-female pair, you know, uh, they were the same price, it would have mattered. Mm -hmm. At least I'd have had a female growing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it kind of put us behind. And then, of course, the crash, because yeah. of all the controversy, you know, brought the price down on them. Uh, you know, and I'm never going to say I lost money on that project, because i am tell you right now, it doesn't matter how much money we lost, the future of that project is bright. I mean, well, I, I agree, and I think that what the work that you and Daniel are doing right now, um, Daniel Allison from Constriction Addiction, I feel like that is, it's educating the public about what scaleless is and isn't, and that the interest and the confidence in the project is growing again, and it's, at that point, I feel like you'll be ahead of the game. Well, the, the problem early on was there was no communication on what was going on with the animals that were around. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, some of the bigger breeders that, that bought it right away, all they were doing was trying to hurry up and make their money and get out of it. Right. And so there was never any real education on that. You know, when, when, when the first ones came out, we didn't know anything about them. Right. You know, we didn't know how to keep them. We, mm -hmm. You know. And I think they were kept. It was experimental. Early on. It was yeah. experimental in the beginning. It still is to this day. I mm -hmm. mean, but we've kind of, you know, with Daniel as many as he's produced over the years, you know, I mean, we've been in touch along the way, you know. But, uh, you know, he's telling me stuff now. You know, I mean, just go ahead and keep them on paper and do this and do that. By I just produced my way. first one today. I know that's so um, awesome. I'm excited. Um, Daniel actually has filmed a series, he has his own channel as well, mm -hmm. he has filmed a care series on how to care for the scaleless, and we can link that in the description box. You guys check it out. It's really cool. It's not complicated. No, He's not. worked out a lot of the bugs, so, I mean, they're just, the feel of these animals is incredible. Their appearance is absolutely insane. They're becoming, um... More they're, people are breeding them, so they're you know their price is gonna well, become affordable. more reasonable. Yeah, they're affordable. Not you know they're not twenty thousand dollars or thirty thousand dollars anymore. You know, I mean they were ridiculous at one time. And so yeah, I, I think it's something that if you're interested in you know some of the newer projects, it's definitely something you want to look into. Something that's going to be really cool down the line. Definitely. You know. Oh, I mean the possibilities are endless because if you think about the thousands of morphs, like you said, mm -hmm. think of any of those in a high def version. That's just. <sighs> well, you just you know. I mean, if anybody's ever seen the leopard, it's on Google. You know, the leopard is a really cool pattern anyway, and just the crisp, clean lines. Mm, oh my beautiful. God. The thing is awesome. Well, um, I, I've occupied your entire afternoon and evening. I so, got some good food out of it, though. Oh, heck yes, I did. Uh, you know I'm fat, so we're going to eat every time we show up. <laughs> well, that's good with me. <laughs> so I want to thank Earl and his family for um, taking us in and entertaining us for the day. You guys are absolutely incredible. I couldn't think of a better way to spend my Labor Day weekend. Actually, the NARBC is in just a few weekends. We chose to drive all the way up here this weekend just to come for the, the cutting of the of the eggs because to me I mean it just that was such an incredible moment that we would have rather be here for that than the NARBC so 
Well, we'll be at the NARBC show. Uh, we're not going to be vending, of course. We'll be walking around. Uh, we'll be out there with Venom Life. So come by the Venom Life table and, and check us out if you're if you're in the Arlington show. Yeah, it's a great show. Uh, also, uh, another Texas Reptile Expo is coming up at the end of September. And I'll have that information in the description box below. That's a venomous show. It's one of my favorite shows because you just never know what you're going to find there. And Bonnie Reisman does an amazing job of organizing that show. And, um, yeah, so exciting things coming up in the reptile world. Make sure and check out the channels of Earl, of course, if you're not already subscribed. Brian Gundy, Daniel Ellison, and... Um, Try to go to the Arlington NARBC and the Texas Reptile Expo. Thank you guys for joining us tonight, and we'll see you soon. Everybody's having a great season.